But before we conclude, Adam Tati Roy, you have not written a novel, you're probably sick of being asked this question, uh, since The God of Small Things. And you said uh, that you may return to novel writing now as a more subversive way of being political. So could you either talk about what you intend to write or what you mean by that? I've been writing straightforward political essays for 15, almost 15 years now. And often they are interventions in a situation that seems to be closing down, you know, whether it was on the dam or whether it was about privatization or whether it was about Operation Green Hunt. And I feel now that, you know, in some ways through those very urgent political essays, which are all interconnected, they are not just separate issues, they are all interconnected and they are together presenting a worldview. Now, I feel that I don't have anything direct to say without repeating myself, but I think what, uh, you know, that, that understanding, which was not just an understanding I had in the past and, and I was just preaching to my readers, you know, it was, I was learning as I wrote and as I grew. And I feel that fiction now will complicate that more, because I, I think the way I think has become more complicated than nonfiction, straightforward nonfiction can can deal with, you know. So I need to break down those proteins and 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 write in a way which I, I don't have to write overtly politically because I I don't believe that. I mean I think what we are made up of, what our DNA is, and how we are wired, will come out in literature without you know, making a great effort to to raise slogans and. Before we end, and before you come out with this next novel that we'll ask you to read next time when you come to the United States, I was wondering if you could read from an earlier essay. It's an, uh, an excerpt that you read at the New School um, when hundreds of people came out to see you here recently. Well, it was it was really the first political, in a way, the first political essay I wrote anyway after the God of Small Things, and it was an essay called "The End of Imagination," when the Indian government uh, conducted a series of nuclear tests in 1998. Um, in early May, before the bomb, I left home for three weeks. I thought I would return. I had every intention of returning. Of course, things haven't worked out quite the way I planned. Of course, by which I meant that India just wasn't the same anymore. While I was away, I met a friend of mine whom I've always loved for, among other things, her ability to combine deep affection with a frankness that borders on savagery. I've been thinking about you, she said, about the god of small things, what's in it, was over it, under it, around it, above it. She fell silent for a while. I was uneasy and not at all sure that I wanted to hear the rest of what she had to say. She, however, was sure that she was going to say it. In this last year, she said, less than a year actually, you've had too much of everything. Fame, money, prizes, adulation, criticism, condemnation, ridicule, love, hate, anger, envy, generosity, everything. In some ways, it's a perfect story, perfectly baroque in its excess. The trouble is that it has, or can have, only one perfect ending. Her eyes were on me, bright with a slanting, probing brilliance. She knew that I knew what she was going to say. She was insane. She was going to say that nothing that happened to me in the future could ever match the buzz of this, that the whole of the rest of my life was going to be vaguely unsatisfying, and therefore the only perfect ending to the story would be death, my death. The thought had occurred to me too, of course it had, the fact that all this, this global dazzle, these lights in my eyes, the applause, the flowers, the photographers, the journalists feigning a deep interest in my life, yet struggling to get a single fact straight, the men in suits fawning over me, the shining, shiny hotel bathrooms with endless towels, none of it was likely to happen again. Would I miss it? Had I grown to need it? Was I a fame junkie? Would I have withdrawal symptoms? 
I told my friend there was no such thing as a perfect story. I said, in any case, hers was an external view of things, this assumption that the trajectory of a person's happiness, or let's say fulfillment, had peaked and now must trough because she had accidentally stumbled upon success. It was premised on the unimaginative belief that wealth and fame were the mandatory stuff of everybody's dreams. You've lived too long in New York, I told her. There are other worlds, other kinds of dreams, dreams in which failure is feasible, honorable, and sometimes even worth striving for, worlds in which recognition is not the only barometer of brilliance or human worth. There are plenty of warriors, warriors that I know and love, people far more valuable than myself, who go to war each day knowing in advance that they will fail. True, they are less successful in the most vulgar sense of the word, but by no means less fulfilled. The only dream worth having, I told her, is to dream that you will live while you're alive and die only when you're dead. Which means exactly what? I try to explain, but didn't do a very good job of it. Sometimes I need to write to think. So I wrote it down for her on a paper napkin, and this is what I wrote. To love, to be loved, to never forget your own insignificance, to never get used to the unspeakable violence and the vulgar disparity of life around you, to seek joy in the saddest places, to pursue beauty to its lair, to never simplify what is complicated or complicate what is simple, to respect strength, never power, above all, to watch, to try and understand, to never look away, and never, never to forget. Arundhati Roy, reading from her essay, The End of Imagination. She's the author of the new book, Capitalism, A Ghost Story. To read an excerpt of that new book, you can go to democracynow.org. We will also link there to our full archive of interviews with Arundhati Roy, as well as her speeches. That's democracynow.org. To watch this